One thing I often communicate in person is that the idea of having a backup plan is great, but that one backup plan may not be enough. And today I'm gonna to expand on the idea of why you need multiple backup plans and how to do that. We started talking about this earlier this year, the trend in the industry of telling people not only to get a second passport, but a third passport. Now you can understand that people who sell passports, want to sell you as many passports as possible. But I, not only as someone in the business of helping people create their backup plan, uh, but someone who's created multiple backup plans in terms of residences, citizenships, bank accounts, business structures, all kinds of things around the world have been living this for many years. I'm going to tell you exactly why one backup plan may not be enough. If it's your first time here, my name is Andrew Henderson. I'm the founder of Nomad Capitalist. We are a boutique consultancy that helps seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally reduce their taxes, diversify and protect their assets and increase their freedom overseas with things like second residences and passports. I'm also the host of the biggest and best offshore conference called Nomad Capitalist Live, which is open to everyone to come and join us. And when I recently said that the country of Portugal uh, was in bad shape in terms of backup options. Someone made a great comment on social media that said, hey, cross that one off your list. That's not going to be a place that if you're in cryptocurrency, for example, is going to be a place where you want to go and move. Uh, it is not going to uh, tick off some of the things that you may have thought it would tick off in the past. Uh, he said, listen, this is why you need multiple plans and you need to, here's the important part, you need to understand some of those backup plans, some of those options that you're keeping in your back pocket may not work out. Think of it like anything else that you do in your life. You get a number of different insurance policies knowing that some won't work, some may be utilized, some won't work the way you wanted them. You have to understand that some of the stuff you're setting up, you are giving yourself options that may change over time, that may come more available over time. And one of the best examples of that that I've told you before is when I got St. Lucia citizenship, I started the process. The idea of paying $100,000 for yet another citizenship seemed like, you know, am I sure I need to do this? Now, I happen to be in the business. I said, this is a great opportunity for mastery. I can tell you how it works. I can have a better understanding of what the process is, the feelings that come with that, the optionality of having yet another passport, more travel options, more flexibility, you know, six more countries that I can go and spend time in without really you know, being questioned, that's a positive thing. But what happened was a number of months after I decided to get this, and I wasn't entirely sure of the exact reasons other than just more optionality, there came some very specific reasons why I said, oh my goodness, I'm really glad that I did this because it's coming in handy for this specific reason. And if it weren't for this specific thing, I would have done this action and I would have been much worse off. So making that $100,000 investment had a great return on investment for me, both in terms of finances and in terms of return on my peace. It created a great peace of mind for me and helped me in a very difficult situation. I wasn't sure what the use was going to be going in. Again, I already had dual citizenship, multiple citizenships, but I said this is going to be a, a great addition. Uh, and so understanding that some of your backup plans may not work is okay. I think that there are people who say, oh, well, you know, Portugal isn't going to work for this specific situation anymore, so this whole concept doesn't really work. No, if you have multiple residences, have multiple accounts, have multiple diversification, you're going to be okay. Let me walk you through some specifics, okay? On the financial side, you're not really going to see, generally speaking, um, a lot of failure in terms of opening bank accounts somewhere else. I mean, I haven't really seen very many banks fail. I've um, seen a couple banks in Montenegro fail, probably have seen a couple banks around the world that have failed or where you know, they just went and did a wholesale closure of people's accounts and they sent the money back in some weird currency. But by and large, that's not the case and that could generally be avoided. By the way, the, the banks that, you know, that I remember closing in Montenegro, I didn't happen to be there, but everyone got their money refunded up to 50,000 euros, which is the government deposit insurance limit. So if you would you know, stay within those deposit insurance limits, you would have been fine other than a little bit of annoyance. So, you know, most banks are going to fail. Certainly any bank could. I come from the United States where lots and lots and lots of banks have failed over the last decade. Um, what a lot of people use multiple offshore banks for is they go and they put 5,000, 10,000, 25, 50, whatever it is, it's a small amount to them in different banks around the world. That can not only facilitate residence permits such as, hey, um, you can go to some countries in the Americas, put $50,000 in the bank, or some countries in Eastern Europe, you know, put $25,000 in the bank, get a residence permit, um, potentially start the clock towards citizenship. And so you're not only diversifying your capital, there may be reporting requirements in the country where you live, or if you're a U.S. citizen, you'll have to file uh, that with the Treasury. But, you know, generally speaking, it's legal for most folks to have offshore bank accounts. And if you're just diversifying money in different accounts, 
What a lot of people do is they say, hey, I'm going to put enough money to where I could live for three months or six months or a year, whatever makes them feel comfortable in these different offshore banks because they've seen things where Canada froze bank accounts, Cyprus had bail-ins, Australia brought in bail-in laws, in the U.S. civil forfeiture laws. You think, hey, this isn't going to apply to me. That's pretty rare stuff. But what's really the harm of going and putting $50,000 in a bank account? Maybe you get a second residence per, uh, permit for free by doing so, and you have some money that if something happens, you can go and access that money. Most of these banks aren't failing. Uh, and so for small amounts, most people feel, feel pretty comfortable. Having diversification is fine. But, you know, listen, if you had five different bank accounts and each one had a tiny amount of money, I mean, if I said I'm going to put, you know, $25,000 in these accounts and one, you know, I lost $25,000 somewhere, I wouldn't really give it a second thought. For you, maybe that amounts 5000 maybe that amounts a million. But, uh, you know, you can look at that from that perspective. Obviously, the bigger the amounts, the better quality banks, the less likely to fail, potentially. So that's how banks work. Stocks, obviously, if you're investing in stocks, if you're investing in real estate, um, if you're investing in any kind of stuff around the world, I mean, investments can go sideways anywhere. Stock markets can go down anywhere. Um, what I've seen is I've seen more easy to get, um, more easy to take, more, more tax-friendly returns, more consistent returns, um, larger returns in emerging countries, in growing countries. It's been a lot easier for me to manage investments like in things like real estate than it was uh, in the United States if I want to actually own properties directly. Now, again, any investment can fail, um, but you know, if, if you know, I've talked in the example I've always used is Cambodia. If my investments in Cambodia failed, it's a small enough part of my net worth, a very small part of my net worth. I'm just moving on with my life. The likelihood that no one's going to ever want to buy real estate in Cambodia again is very low, so I don't worry about that. But let's talk about the bigger areas where I think backup plans are important. That's residences and citizenships. Okay. And so can you get a residence permit that your goal is, let's say you're going to get a couple of different paper residence permits. A paper residence is where you go and you fulfill the terms of the residence permit, putting money in the bank, making a donation, starting a business, hiring some people, buying a property, what have you. And there is no hard physical presence requirement in the law that says you must spend a specific amount of time here to become a citizen. A country like Canada, for example, has very specific number of days. In a certain number of days, it's you know, three to five years, for example. And if you're there one day less, hey, you, know, you may not make it. Um, not every country has that. And so then in some countries, it's up to judge's discretion and you can kind of make a case to a judge. In other countries, they just don't care. They don't track. Um, but a paper residence is where there is no particular amount of days that you need to get. And so you can go and get a residence permit. And then three years later, four years later, five years later, what have you, you go and apply for your citizenship. Maybe you need to go there once a year, check in, uh, but you're not living there. You're not changing your lifestyle. Is one of those going to be as likely to turn into a citizenship as, let's say, a citizenship by investment program where it's just a, 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 an open um, you know, transaction. You make a donation to our country, we're going to, um, to make you a registered citizen. No. So if I'm getting paper residence, I might want to get two or three of those. And so therefore, the likelihood that one of those could fail, well, that's why I'm getting multiple ones of them. I want to increase my chances of, in the future, having some kind of citizenship at a much lower price point than going out and just investing in citizenship by investment in, let's say, St. Lucia uh, directly. So St. Lucia is going to cost me $100,000 plus a whole bushel basket of fees, whereas I could go and do you know, three paper residences and the fees might be the same as St. Lucia minus the donation. Maybe there's some nominal investments I need to make, but I'm not going to be sacrificing that $100,000. So I'm trading basically certainty and I'm trading time, but I'm making up for the certainty by getting more than one of them under Interesting that if one is a 50% chance, one is a 70% chance, one is a 75% chance, you know, I'm probably going to get one or two of those in a certain number of years. Certain residence permits may become less attractive in the future. Um, you may have a residence permit, you know, there were a handful of them that during COVID became less useful. Certain people couldn't get in, um, particularly if you were from a larger country like the United States. Some countries just said, if your passport on your residence is from a country with a high number of COVID cases, you know, the United States is going to have more COVID cases than Tuvalu, right, just by nature. And they didn't really specify per 100,000, per million. They just said a high number of cases. And so that became less valuable. But if you had multiple places, people ask me where I live. And in the last couple of years since the pandemic started, you know, I started out in Southeast Asia. I was in Malaysia, then went to Eastern Europe. So I kind of, you know, wrote out the very beginning of in, in Asia, then was in Asia when it was, you know, relatively open, then went to Eastern Europe as they became super open, then went to Latin America as they became super open, kind of bounced around Latin America, was in Mexico, back in Eastern Europe. I mean, so basically where I've been in the last two years has been different because there have been some places that just haven't been as, as open or where I didn't want to spend the time. A country where you have residents could change its tax rules. And so uh, Malaysia, where I spend time, 
had proposed the idea of um, making taxes nominally more difficult. I don't know that would have been a, a game changer, but it would, would have been nominally more difficult. Um, and I think it would have been fine for most people, but it would just put a bit of a little bit more work. They backed off and they're not going to do that at least for the next five years. Okay. Now, I don't know that it would have affected me directly. And if it did, I would have been happy to pay a little something. But um, the idea of a residence could become tax friendly. Costa Rica, for example, has flirted with becoming less tax friendly. It's a relatively tax friendly place now. If you have a residence in Costa Rica and you spend time there, you may need to adjust. Is it ideal that you go and you say, hey, I love Costa Rica, I want to spend time there, and then they come in and change the tax policy? No, but the nature of what nomad capitalist is, is that you're going somewhere. You don't have to be always on the move. The nomad part doesn't mean you're always on the move. What it means is you're on the move when circumstances no longer uh, favor you. And you get to define what favors you. If 5% tax or 10% tax or a flat 100,000 euros in tax is acceptable, I'm not here to pay, say you should pay zero. We don't pay zero. But we pay, you know, what I think is a very fair amount. And so if a country says, oh, OK, well, we're not going to be fair anymore, then you can move on. Citizenships may be the same thing where I've said if you qualify for citizenship by descent, you know, unless it's in Cuba or Iran or some other country that may be an issue. I think I, I talked to someone who uh, whose children's mother was from Pakistan and like, eh, yeah, OK, it's probably not helping the cause. But most citizenships by descent. I would claim them. If you can go and claim your Italian citizenship by descent, why not do that? Now, is there some chance that as the European Union um, opens up and tries to make it so that a strict majority rather than everybody in the union has to vote for higher, for more tax rules, um, that you know some of these countries could become less tax advantageous? Could they start chasing people for taxes? Eh, maybe, I don't know. Um, it's really hard to say. Uh, but would I take that citizenship for now, knowing that perhaps I have a way out later if I decide it doesn't serve me? We've discussed this in greater detail, but listen, I I'm going to have as many options as possible. And you know what? There's a chance one of them may not work. Now, I have um, a number of citizenships that I've obtained through investment and through other reasons. Um, but you know, for me, the mix of those countries are ones that are probably going to, to leave me alone. I can't even say that was entirely by design. Uh, but it just happened to be that they are, you know, residences and citizenships are from countries that I believe will leave me alone. On the other hand, you know, uh, someone might appreciate the optionality of having EU citizenship, of having Canadian citizenship, even though people like Jagmeet Singh in Canada want to roll out citizenship based taxation. So residents and citizenships are things where I think you want to keep yourself flexible. Having more than one residence is a good idea. Now, from a human standpoint, the idea of if you haven't traveled a lot, setting up three or four or five different residences, all of which in countries that strategically make sense and that you think you might like but you haven't been to, obviously there may be some kind of minimally staggered approach where you say, listen, I'm going to set up one or two now and over the next year I'm going to commit to traveling a lot and cementing from a list of six we might make for somebody uh, one or two more of those. Right. And so I think that, as always, some residences and some citizenships may be purely strategic. Some may be purely places that you enjoy. But understand that not every additional option is going to entirely work out. I feel that, generally speaking, we can predict you know, where the world is going um, in terms of like tax policy. Where the world is going in terms of pandemics, obviously, it was harder pr to predict. Um, but we've seen, I guess, now two years of data in terms of um, what that looks like as the world now reopens. I think that the idea that you're just going to get one citizenship and one residence, that's going to make you better off than 99% of the rest of the world. If you want to be better off than 99.999% of the world and have total freedom that no matter what happens, you're going to have places to go, you want to understand that the second passport, the second residence may not be the one in every single situation. We can debate what kind of situations you're concerned about and try and plan around that. But if you're concerned about a whole number of, as one gentleman said, black swan events, then you know, realizing that one residence, one passports may, may not serve every single black swan event out there is important to realize. And so it affects the financial part. I think that's more easily managed. But residence and citizenship, I think accumulating more of those, especially if you can find some which are pure play investments where you're not basically out of pocket very much uh, or where there's not really any kind of investment. Latin America potentially could be good, depending on whether you want to live there or not. Um, you know, Eastern Europe has a number of, of affordable options. I mean, there are a number, you can go to Southeast Asia and invest in things that are investments where you can preserve your capital. So depending on how much money you want to put out, uh, there are all kinds of residents and citizens options. We cover them here in the channel. I encourage you to watch about them, read about them on nomadcapitalist.com. Work with us uh, as a client at nomadcapitalist.com and we can help you plan this all out. But having multiple blackout plans, I think, is going to be important.